Okay, so in 2017, when Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi was named Glassdoor's Two Glassdoor's list of top 100 CEOs, Dara's mom, Lily, said, nice, you made it to the top 100. Now his dad, Oscar, said, uh, number 39 is good son, but you were number 11 in 2015. <laughs> well, those high expectations come from a family that owned and managed one of Iran's largest conglomerates and from the many, the, the many challenges that this family faced as well. In 1978, as the Islamic Revolution approached, Dara's prominent father was targeted and the family fled to France and then the US. The youngest of three, Dara was nine years old. Educated and mentored in New York's Westchester County, Dara's strong math and soccer skills distinguish him in high school. And he excelled at Brown University where he earned a BS in 1991 in electrical and electronics engineering. In his first job at Allen & Company, where he met an Allen client, Barry Diller, of USA Networks, Dara later became senior vice president for strategic planning and president at USA Networks, and then president of IAC, an internet conglomerate controlled by Diller. In 2001, IAC purchased uh, Expedia, and in 2005, Dara became CEO. During his tenure as CEO at Expedia, he did a really good job. The gross value of its hotel and other travel bookings more than quadrupled, and its pre-tax earnings more than doubled, and they acquired and merged competitors, Travelocity and Orbit. Then came Uber, where in 2017, as Uber acolytes would say, Dara the math guy, was tapped to become the culture-ravaged ride-hailing company's CEO and lead an IPO. So despite COVID and a near shutdown of their rides business, Uber Eats soared as now 49% of their business, and Uber Freight acquired logistics uh, service provider TransPlace in a $2.25 billion deal that extends Uber's reach in the U.S. domestic shipping sector. Uber 2022 revenue for the three months through September was up a whopping 72% from a year ago to 8.3 billion. Yes, that's just for one quarter, I believe. Adjusted earnings hit 516 million, its strongest ever, and both were above Wall Street expectations. So before Dara took the job, I'm told he consulted his biggest fan and toughest critic, his father, and Dara recalls that his dad said, when a company that is a verb offers you a job, say yes. So I know I'm speaking for all the members of the Economic Club and guests here tonight. It's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here. So I'm excited to spend the next 50 minutes learning all about you, okay? Can't wait. Are it's you ready for that? Thank you for having me. Thank you. We are just thrilled to have you here. So before we start, I have a lot of stuff to cover. Okay. And I cool. will mention that I recently talked to Dara's brother, Kave. So I got some good insider information, which we will weave in here. I, I was not happy to hear I know. she talked to my older brother. I know, brother, I did not tell you I was we'll doing that. We'll see how that. that goes. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Um, but I would love to start with your personal life, your family, your journey. I mean, it's just so fascinating. We have a lot to learn about Uber as well. And I no know comments. tonight. No comments. Okay, he said this all is not gonna be talked about. But so your life story really is a very compelling one, right? So, and I think, especially with what's happening today in Iran, but just, yeah. you know, the fact that you come from this family, that was very prominent. I think your father was in a very diverse set of businesses, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, food distribution. Then the Islamic Revolution yeah. happened. And uh, I think most of us are old enough to remember this a bit, but we didn't live it like you did. Your family fled the country when you were nine. So I just thought maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what your life was like when that was happening. Yeah, so I think from, from my standpoint, I was the lucky one, my brothers were the lucky ones because we were young. And I think that the ability for kids to adapt is pretty extraordinary, actually, to whether the circumstances are very adverse or somewhat adverse. The toughest thing was, was for my family uh, and my mom and dad. We, we had a big family business in Iran. My father had spent his, his life along with the rest of the family building that business. Uh, and, you know, in the U.S., we take for granted uh, the fact that, for example, everything that you've worked for in your life can't be just taken away from you. And that's exactly what happened to my family. Uh, we had to flee to France. Uh, and honestly, we thought that we'd just be in France to, and 
you know, we wait there until things settle down. Uh, and things never settle down. Uh, and we were lucky enough to have an uncle in Irvington, New York. Uh, and school was starting and we went uh, to my uncle's house and we stayed there with my cousins, etc. And for the kids, honestly, like, the U.S. was pretty cool. You had like 35 channels of cable TV. <laughs> like, the, there was, like, for us, the, the adjustment was fine. And, and we always had family around us. So even mm. though we were in a foreign country, uh, we always had Iranian food at night, and we had cousins all over the place, and aunts and, and, and uncles. So we were able to make the adjustment pretty well. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough that where I, myself and my brothers, we, we look like soccer superstars because soccer <laughs> wasn't, that, uh, wasn't that popular at the time. So you milked that as much as you could. It, you know, we, we, we got to be one of the popular kids because we Smart. could score goals, which was pretty cool. <laughs> Uh, so we, we were lucky enough to make the adjustment, but I would say for my parents, it was a much, much tougher adjustment yeah. uh, to make. Well, did I read also that your father went back to take care of his father yes. and then didn't come back to the States for a while? Yeah, he, a, his dad was at his deathbed, and my father wanted to go back to be there with him, um, and my grandfather made a miraculous recovery. Uh, but my father couldn't leave uh, for six years. So I still remember when he left, he was really tall. And then when he came back, I think I was a sophomore at college. And he was so little all of a sudden because I'd grown. And like someone who I looked up to all of a sudden was, was shorter than I was. And that was a shock. And he drove me to college that sophomore year. And he just wanted to hang around. I'm like, Dad, but I'm here. You know, you it's can go now. <laughs> but you know, he he was. I was. I remembered him as, you know, the tall father, and I think he remind he re remembered me as a little kid. Why couldn't he leave all that time? Uh, he couldn't leave because he was on a do not fly list. Okay. Uh, and my family business, because it was, uh, we were wealthy, at the time. You know, anyone who was part of the establishment was considered persona non grata. Hmm. Uh, so after my dad, uh, my dad came back, he was on the flight and finally had, you know, gone away. And these guards came onto the flight and said, is Asghar Khosr Shahi, that's the Iranian pr pronunciation, on the flight. So they were about to take him. He didn't say anything. He had a heart attack on the flight. Uh, flew to Paris, there was like a four or five hour layover, came to the States, my mom saw him, said you're going straight to the hospital, he had triple bypass surgery, uh, and you know, he's lived. fine now. It's a miracle. Yeah, right? it's that's amazing. A, so we, we all made a pact, the men made a pact that we're not going back to Iran after that happened. Yeah. This is well, a pretty good place to be. Yes, it is. And you know, I mean, you're just an incredible example, of course, of an immigrant to the U.S. I know you also are passionate about refugee rights. So talk a little bit about that kind of today, how you look at immigration or refugees, and also, of course, how this shapes how you are as a leader. So I, I think, you know, we are a nation of immigrants here. Uh, I was incredibly lucky. It was just a stroke of luck for us to come to, to the States, and we got to rebuild our lives. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that is so powerful uh, and when you look at Uber, a very significant portion of our drivers and our couriers are immigrants, uh, they're minorities, yeah. uh, and the using of the platform to really enter the economic system. So immigration, supporting immigrants, supporting refugees, for example, uh, we, we did a big program in terms of uh, supporting refugees from Af Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, finding them homes, et cetera. And also, for example, on the app, uh, for the app to be translated into Urdu uh, so for cool. these refugees to be able to find work, et cetera. So it's, it's a part of what we do. And the really cool thing about Uber is the impact that it has in terms of earners having opportunities to, to enter the economy and start to make some money, um, meet some other folks, mm -hmm. et cetera. And that entry point is something that we take very, very seriously. Well, and you know, we'll talk a lot more about Uber, but I did wonder if that was part of the attraction for you when you were asked to be the CEO, is that connection to the folks, you know, who are your drivers? Uh, your I think connectors. that's one of the things. Yeah. It, it really, the impact that the company has, mm -hmm. we've got five million people around the world earning on our platform, whether part-time or full-time mm -hmm. or somewhere in between. 
and that opportunity to lead a company that is so important and has so much impact, that was ultimately what was the, was the deciding uh, factor in addition to being a verb, which is pretty cool. A verb, to Uber, yes. Um, but in all seriousness, so staying on around for a minute, can you say more about the current uprisings? And I know that many of us here understand it, we're paying attention to it. It's tough to watch, especially for young women, I think in the country here, learning more about what the conditions are there. Yes. But just what's your sense about where it goes from here to the extent that you feel you can comment? On that? Well, I, it may be advisable to comment or not, but I, I will. Um, you know, they, this is not the first time that these mm -hmm. kinds of uprisings ha have happened. Uh, un and unfortunately in the past, um, they have fizzled out uh, and, and have not worked out. The fact is that the current regime that we have in Iran is an incredibly oppressive regime uh, that is doing a deep injustice, not just to the women of Iran, but to the youth of Iran. Uh, and, you know, my heart goes out to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Iran wants to be a part of the international community. And I think that the women and youths who are marching, because I think that the crackdowns can be absolutely brutal. Mm -hmm. These are incredibly brave people. And, you know, I think all of us, the international community, should support them in any way that, that they can. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, staying on the, the topic of your family and background and whatnot, one of the things, again, Kaveh talked a lot to me about is something actually really resonated with me, coming from a big Irish Catholic family. You know, my grandfathers came from Ireland, but, but most important, like most of our families here in Chicago, and, uh, you know, three of my daughters are here tonight. We have tons of met them. nieces and nephews, yes, and grand nieces and nephews and siblings, and, you know, we spent a lot of time together, which is great, but I don't think there's any way, shape, or form we could be as big of a family as you guys are, <laughs> but what Kaveh told me about is that, like, I think any a given, you know, cookout in his backyard is 50 people, but it's your cousins and your siblings and your second cousins and your second cousins twice removed. I, you're all still so tight we are. and competitive, so there's that. But, you know, is this some of this about kind of the experience your family had, would you say, and kind of having each other's back as you come to a new country? Or tell me more. Or is it common from where you were from that this is culturally I, true? I or? think culturally, so in Iran, pretty much I think the whole nation is a cousin of mine mm -hmm. one way or the other. So you know well, your they'd like to be, cousins and second cousins <laughs> and third cousins and your, your great aunt, right. et cetera. One, so the, the culture is a culture of hospitality, of inclusion, mm. uh, and we don't like being alone. Uh, so we like company <laughs> and we like family. And then of course when we came to the States, family was our umbrella. And mm -hmm. even though my, fam my family had lost everything monetarily, we always had family around. And I was one of the younger cousins. I'm still, when I hang out with my cousins, I'm one of the kids. Uh, they very Love readily that. put me in, in, in my place. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that is the one constant that we've had in what has been a uh, time of some pretty significant change for us. Mm -hmm. Last family question. So I also love to bring my mom to things when she was yes. with us. I found when I bring my mom to things, people are always a lot nicer to you. You know, they're like, you know, yes. hey, we love your daughter. It's like you're saying that because my mom is here. It's That's a wonderful easy. shield. It's a shield, you know. <laughs> but I did read, and I, well, I didn't read, I heard about that you brought your mom to the Fortune Most Powerful Women event to come on stage. She with is you. the most powerful woman well, in there my life. Well, there you go. So. That is a way to win over a woman's audience. With apologies audience. to my wife, but yeah. it's true. Yeah. But, but that, was, that was a good move to win over a, an audience like that. But, <laughs> but tell us about your mother. I think from the things I read, I mean, your family did have to rebuild here, yes, right? And yes. she really scrimped and saved, I think, to get you to a great university. Um, yeah. Probably many more things that she did for you, but talk a little well, bit about Well, she had Lily. to raise three boys, three te teenagers I in know. the U.S. on her own, which was, She's a saint. <laughs> which was difficult enough. But I think one of the big adjustments that my mom had to make was that she, she had to work. You know, she, she grew up in a, in a very wealthy family and she had to raise three boys on her own and then she got a job as a salesperson in a, in a boutique called Celine in New York and mm -hmm. she would commute to New York every day and then she would come home exhausted and somehow managed to cook you know, 18 dishes for us a night. Wow. Uh, so yeah. I, all of us owe a lot to her mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was the least I could do to, uh, to take her to that event. That was really cool. 
So let's go now into more of the, your background and your career before Uber. Sure. So the Alan Are and the Kaveh questions over? Well, well no, there's okay. still more coming. Oh. So don't worry, I got I got a couple. But Kaveh, speaking of which, so he's also at Allen and Company, where yes, you, he is. you spent a long time in your career. That's where you also met Barry Diller. You became known as one of the killer Dillers. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's a thing. Um, but anyways, but Diller was obviously is a very successful person. Yes. He mentored Jeffrey Katzenberg and Michael Eisner, not bad company. You know, you joined and worked with him in a couple of places. But you also had Herbert Allen. Yes. So you had two really different mentors you know, early so. in your career. And I think, you know, it'd be really interesting just to hear about what you learned from each of them, how that helped shape you as a leader, the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll start with Herbert because my, my first job was in investment banking in New York. I was a I was an engineer and I was set to go into a management training program and I fell in love with a commodities trader in New York so I jumped uh, to New York and found the only job I could which was in investment banking uh, and Allen and Company is one of the top firms You make firms it sound there. like that's a bad job. Like if I'm it, the it only was, job, it, anybody it, invests it, in it just goes to like, don't take that. <laughs> yeah, you plan your whole career and, and then and you, you, know, you do something because uh, you fall in love with someone. I think we broke up in like three weeks but still, <laughs> I got to New York uh, and and really, the lesson that I learned from, from Herbert Allen was, I remember he, he always told me, he doesn't bet on companies, he bets on people. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a, and I, and at the time, you know, it's like, yes, sir, Herbert, you know, yes, I, absolutely. And, and I didn't get it. And as I've gotten older in my life, and as I've had more, more and more experience, I just see so much so much about how important it is to build um, people that you trust around you and to really bet on people. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately with Barry, he was a, um, he was a client of mine, uh, Allen and Company was an investment bank that really focused in the entertainment sector. And I remember when I met him, he was um, going after, there was a hostile tender offer for Paramount Pictures. Mm -hmm. He was running QVC, which is a home shopping network, Sumner Redstone, who's another legend mm -hmm. in the media sector, had made a bid for Paramount Pictures, and Barry wanted to come in, and there was a hostile tender offer for, uh, for uh, the firm. I was a young analyst who was running all the financial models, uh, et cetera. And I remember Barry, there, there was a lot of debt involved. He said, and we were raising bids and borrowing more money, et cetera, and he said, well, I want to meet the person who is building all these models so that I know hmm. that uh, he's not full of crap. Uh, and so literally he sat down with me and I had to, and I was just shaking. I wow. was just like, because this is, this guy's a. And you, you had know. to take him through the model. Yeah, I had to take him through every single detail of the wow. model. Uh, hmm. and, and once he established that trust, then he really trusted me as far as the, as far as the bid goes and, and we built a relationship. That deal failed, mm -hmm. but I became his banker uh, from then on. Uh, and then he sold QVC, established Home Shopping Network, which became USA Network, and mm -hmm. he said, I want you to come work for me. I thought I was going to be at Allen & Company for my whole life. It mm -hmm. was, it, it's a great firm, yeah. I loved it. But that was the time when I took Herbert's advice. And I said, if there's what, one Herbert person. Herbert was trying to kick you out, you're saying? No, he, <laughs> by the way, Herbert said, you'll be back in a, in, in a year. Um, <laughs> and, but, but I wanted to make a bet on Barry. Ah. Uh, and, and he's been, he was my boss for 20 years. And it was a great ride, but I, I owe him everything as it relates to my career. That's really cool. And he took a bet on you. Right? I mean, yes. moving you yeah. from being a, an analyst in an investment banking firm to an ultimately being CEO of one of his companies, I right? built good model at the time. Yes, exactly. Nothing wrong with that. Yes. Models really matter. Well then, so you were named head of Expedia in 2005. Again, as I said in the intro, did pretty well there. Two billion to eight billion. It was a great ride. Four X, not bad, not bad. Uh, largest online travel agency in the, in the country. So I'm gonna shift to Uber, but maybe before I do, anything else you wanna say about Expedia? Like what you learned there? What are some of the lessons that helped you then? Well, I think for, for Expedia, it, it was a pretty extraordinary transformation of um, our riding the wave of travel going from offline to online. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, it was a really valuable experience because it really was a turnaround and we had to rebuild our whole technology stack from the bottom up 
Yeah. And that lesson for me um, is that, you know, if you're a technology company with crappy tech, you're going to die. Uh, and Expedia was, you know, on that way, but we made really at the time what were bold investments in replatforming everything from the bottom up. And it was something that really worked out. Was it a me. public company at the time? It was a public company the whole so time. So how did you get those investment analyst types who have those models that are cranky about building their models and how much you're going to invest? How did you, honestly, I'm curious how you got the shareholders along on that journey. Because when you talk about the entire tech stack, that's not cheap. No, it was not cheap. But I had the benefit of having a controlling shareholder whose that name helps. was Barry Diller. Okay. And he didn't give a crap about what okay. those analysts thought. Lot to be said for that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Lot exactly. to be said for that. Good. All right, so. I had cover. I had yeah, cover. you did have cover. All yes. right, so so then Uber comes knocking. Now, back to Kave. Okay, apparently your father said if it's a company called with a verb, go take it. Apparently Kave was like, no, correct? Yes. He, he said, he, well, as, I hope it's okay to say that. He sure. said he advised you against it. Uh, I don't know why. He did. You His language was a little more colorful. Okay, yes. he didn't say that to me. But, uh, <laughs> but talk about, you know, what, well, you know, what got you ready what made you think well there's a lot to unpack it once you get started yeah. but like what was the thing that said okay this is the right thing i'm ready i want this uh, alcohol it's, okay uh it, actually semi seriously there uh <laughs> there was uh daniel Eck, who is the ceo of spotify founder and ceo of spotify he's a friend and apparently he recommended me to the headhunter headhunter had called me uh i said no, absolutely not. I've been at Expedia for 13 years. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to keep going and it was going to be my last job. And I love the travel sector. For me, travel's always been a personal passion. Uh, and so I was having drinks with Daniel uh, and my wife Sid, and he said, you know, I recommended you for this job. You, you really should, should take the job. I said, Daniel, like, what are you, crazy? I'm happy. I'm doing great at Expedia. I'm so happy here. I, I wouldn't want to go elsewhere. And he looks at me with these like cold Scandinavian eyes and he said, Dara, since when is life about being happy? <laughs> said, oh my God. Wow, that's so, cool. you know, uh, he said, it's about having impact. It's about doing something great. Uber's a great company and it needs you to, um, to, to lead it. Uh, and at the time, honestly, the, there were incredible names, I think, like Jeffrey Immelt was yeah. being considered, uh, and, and there were some, you know, real capital names considered, and I thought, what the heck? So, I, the next morning, I called back the headhunter, I said, you know, put me in the game, let's see what happens. Wow. You yeah, know, it was pretty cool. That is, that is cool. Now, you know, listen, we all were reading the news and watching what was happening at the time, so you walked into what one might call a hot mess. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. But I mean, you know, seriously, the workplace culture, you know, was toxic. There's a lot going on there. I don't need to get into all of it. But, and the company was losing money, I think, at the time. So, uh, a couple talk, of billion. Yeah. yeah, a couple of 2.8 billion is the number I read. So, uh, you know. Details, details. Details, details, details. You know, yeah. And the, not to mention, there was challenges in a lot of countries that kind of didn't really want Uber there. So, we could go on probably for hours about, you know, why you decided to, to take this on, because it was a huge challenge. Yes. But I'm curious, maybe you can say more about that, but then also, what were the first days like? Because you literally were flying around, meeting heads of states, and you had to deal with a culture that really needed fixing. So, where do we start? Oh, boy. Uh, so, you know, one of, one, of the, one of the pieces of training that I really value about engineering is that, it teaches you to break down problems. Hmm. Uh, you take, you know, it's vector math, it's three-dimensional math, you can just break it down into, you know, three different one-dimensional problems that are relatively easy to solve, mm -hmm. and you get a three-dimensional answer. So, one, it, you know, I, th there were very specific issues with Uber. One was a governance, the board was at war mm -hmm. for essentially the, the control of the company. That's something that I had to take on. Uh, second was culture mm -hmm. of the company, and, and I was, the culture needed to be fundamentally changed, but at the same time, and, and you know, a lot of people don't talk about this, there was an entrepreneurial culture right. about the company and a builder's culture and, and, and you know, a, an mm. aggressive kind of go-get-it mentality that was great, yeah. but it was a company that was a disruptor that at some point became 
the size of an incumbent and still uh, retain those disruptive mm -hmm. tactics. And it kind of started looking like a bully, mm. right? But mm -hmm. there were elements of the culture that were absolutely terrific that I wanted to bring this builder culture, entrepreneurial culture, and combine it with the idea of, you know, once you get to that size and once you're such an important part of society is to do the right thing and not just build for yourself, but take into account your drivers, your couriers, the, the, the governments that you're working with, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So culture was the second mm -hmm. area that uh, we had to reform. Third one was management team. And again, they were great operators at the company, but we didn't have a CFO, we didn't have a proper general counsel. Uh, the company was not at all diverse, so we had to work on management and diversity within, mm -hmm. within the company. And then there was this little thing about losing two and a half billion dollars as well. Uh, so though there were kind of those four separate issues that we had to take on. So I sat down with the team, I spent the first week or two listening, mm -hmm. understanding, well, what are the issues that, that you've got to take on? And then if you try to take them all on at the same time, you're going to be, you're going to drown. But we started hitting each one. Uh, and, you know, once in a while I got, I think it was the third week of my job, I got called, uh, our London license got suspended. I had to yeah. fly to London and meet TFL and, and, you know, demonstrate to them that new leadership and the new Uber truly wanted to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we went through those, those kinds of issues, but little by little, I still remember there was an all hands and we had all hands every two weeks where I answer questions to all of our employees. And there was a question where one of the employees asked about, hey, we really have a PR problem at Uber. Everything that we do is looked at in a negative way. What do we do to fix it? And I said to the company, I said, we don't have a PR problem, we have an us problem. If you want mm. the image of the company to change, we've got to start first changing what we do, who we think we are, how we operate, who we think about, who we take into consideration, and then the rest will take care of itself. And it's gonna be really slow. You know, mm -hmm. to change someone's reputation, it's very easy to lose yeah. it. It's really hard to earn it back. And we are still on that journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I hardly remember those days are crazy days, but I think we're making progress. But there's a lot, there's a lot to do. Were there any of those early days where like, what the heck did I sign up for here? Um, yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Thursday, Friday. <laughs> Saturdays no. and Sundays were okay. Okay, well that's good. But you know, the, there's so much to unpack there. I'd love to, maybe one other question before I move on, which is, you know, when you're taking a job as a CEO, you're hired by the board, mm -hmm. and then you get on, and then you have a board. And I remember one of the first times I was a CEO, I think I went home and said something about meeting with my boss today, and one of my kids, they were a lot younger, so well, I don't think you have a, I didn't think you had a boss, you're the CEO. I'm like, oh, I got 12 bosses now, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's how it works. But um, how did you navigate? Because the board hired you for certain things, but I have a feeling you did things differently than in some ways the board was expecting or wanting. I'm just curious if how you navigated some of that relationship. Well, I think that I was lucky enough in that uh, when I came on, the board was essentially split into two. Mm -hmm. There was one half of the board that supported uh, Travis and the founding team, mm -hmm. and there was the other half of the, of the board who wanted them out. Uh, and and I, I was able to bring on a chairman, Ron Sugar, uh, who he's on the board of Apple, Amgen, uh, has been uh, a CEO, has extraordinary experience, and really partnering up with Ron to reformulate the board so that the board, you know, I remember telling the board, you know, we've got to get a board that is not fighting about control but is actually fighting for the company. Right. Uh, and so we were able to reformulate the board, bring in some uh, new board members, uh, and that allowed you know, Ron and myself to get the company moving in the right direction so that the board was working with me, mm -hmm. always held me accountable, but bringing Ron on as chairman was a key, key element right. of the turnaround. Well, wait, actually, I have a lot more to ask, but before I do, is it true that you sometimes personally drop off Uber Eats orders? I do. Is that so, true? Has anybody here yeah. had Doris drop off an order at your house? Because honestly, I think everybody wants to see that. It, it was actually during the pandemic. So okay. during the pandemic, I was going crazy on yet another Zoom call, et cetera. 
Uh, and so I, I, I have an e-bike in, in uh, San Francisco and I started delivering uh, for Uber Eats. It got me out of the house, it got me some fresh air. Uh, and, and it was a really important, it was really important for me to experience the earner experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, and, and that, the, the empathy for earners, you know, when I first started, it's scary starting to, to deliver. Mm -hmm. You go to the restaurant, you don't know where to pick yeah. up the food, you don't know exactly where you're doing. It, it's actually getting going onto the platform can be pretty scary, mm -hmm. you feel pretty lonely. Um, and I still remember the, the, the workers at the restaurant were so helpful. I'm like, where do I pick stuff up? They're like, come on over here, are you new? And I'm like, yeah, I am. So uh, it, was, it, it was just really cool. Oh like they were, they were so hel helpful. Um, it was, it was actually a little bit sad. Much? I got tipped, okay. I got tipped pretty well. Good. Um, it, but, but it's amazing, there were some people who were so lazy, like you go to San Francisco downtown, <laughs> And they would order like a burrito from a place <laughs> two blocks away. And I'm like, oh, just so can't you just hysterical. go down and walk two blocks? And you know, like, like the, the guy oh. opens the door and he's in his underwear and his robe. I'm like, okay, good thing you didn't go outside. <laughs> Although with oh. San Francisco, you might look like anyone. Yeah, um, exactly. So, <laughs> you, you know, it, it was, for me, it was a great experience. Oh but but, but in, a, in a serious way, I do think that for us as a company, we did not have enough empathy for our couriers, for our drivers, mm -hmm. and that experience. Um, I drive now as well. Uh, I have a five-star ready. I'm a good driver. No, you don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know how ready. that happened because your yeah. brother, one of the other secrets from I, him. I suck as a rider, well, but I'm a good driver. But your brother said you're not a good driver. I mean, that was unsolicited. So He I, hasn't taken a ride with me yet. Okay, so. all right. That was kind of unsolicited. I'm not actually kidding. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's, well, I want to talk a lot more about how you lead the earner team, the sure. culture. But I want to start with the last quarter. I mean, you know, God knows it's great to have, it's better to have a good quarter than a bad quarter. Is this it better is than a stick in the eyes, I like to say. I've we had, had a really, both. We had a really, yeah, we've all had both. So we had a really great quarter at a time that tech companies aren't having great quarters right now. I know you're more than a tech company, but 30%, you know, gross bookings up Q3. You raised your guidance. So what's interesting, at least from what I can understand about your business, you actually have a lot of buffers around various forms of what's happening in the economy, right? So people are coming out more, so maybe people are ordering in less, but there's more people driving, inflation's up, so maybe people need to make more money, you know, if employment is an issue, people have more drivers, more earners, so you have a lot of dynamics. So I know you're not an economist, maybe you play one on TV, but I'm, <laughs> people always ask CEOs, well, what do you think about, what's your outlook for 2023 as you look forward, to, you know, economically? Well, I, I think the outlook is anyone's guess, um, but what the patterns that we are seeing is, first of all, the consumer's strong. So I know that there's a lot of worry about the economy. Consumer spend continues to be strong. Some of it may be fueled by credit, but uh, what we see on the ground, both in terms of spend on mobility and spend on delivery, is consumer spend continues to be strong, not just in the US, but even in Europe, Latin America, et cetera. We are benefiting from the shift of spend on retail, mm -hmm. which is where you are, yes. Uh, and you know, people being home at the pandemic, buying stuff for their home, ordering uh, yet another package from Amazon, now that spend is shifting back over to spend on services. Mm -hmm. And we are very much in the service sector, right. both in terms of eats and in mobility. Uh, people are getting out again, mm -hmm. you know. Our business in Chicago now is booming, which is terrific. Yep. Uh, and so we are benefiting from the consumer being strong and the shift of spend going from retail to services. Uh, and when you look at our business, you know, it is a consumer facing business. Um, it is an everyday spend category. So at least what we are seeing is that while consumers are pulling back and spend for some higher price items, you know, buying houses, et cetera, or things that where you had to borrow money, mm -hmm. you know, getting an Uber to go to dinner is an everyday activity that we see zero signs of weakness at this point. Even with prices going up, which they have. Yes, I Uber, mean, right? you know, inflation has affected every mm -hmm. single category. Right. So Uber isn't the only category um, that's been affected, but prices are up. They're up chiefly because we have not been able to, until now things are getting much better, get enough drivers on the road. Mm -hmm. 
you know, after the pandemic, a lot of our drivers started delivering food, which is great. Right. Uh, but because there are safety issues, a lot of them had their doubts in terms of getting back to driving people in the car. Uh, so about a year ago, we went very aggressively in terms of growing our driver base. Uh, and our driver base now is increasing pretty substantially on a year-on-year -year basis. That is now improving ETAs, mm -hmm. uh, getting surge lower. So pricing should be stable to hopefully down slightly as we bring more supply into the marketplace. And I do think in a weaker economy um, and with inflation being a factor, we actually have more earners coming onto the right. platform saying about 70% of our earners are saying, hey, inflation is actually one of the reasons why they're coming onto the platform because they can earn flexibly and they can you know, earn another 500 bucks a week for groceries or mm -hmm. whatever else they need to live. Right. Um, I mean, this is, you guys, are, Uber is sort of the start of the gig economy in many ways, Very right? much so. And much it so. is, uh, well, I'm going to talk a lot more about the drivers. So you mentioned Chicago, so let's yes. start, let's stay on that for a second, because we are here in Chicago. Love the Chicago. Economic Club in Chicago, yes. So there's a lot to talk about here. I know you've spent a few days, a mm -hmm. couple of days here, meeting with some of your um, partners, some of your drivers, earners, uh, some of the folks in the city of Chicago. You also have Uber Freight based here in Chicago, yes. which I don't know if that, Probably many of you know about this. It's uh, one of your smallest uh, business units, but one of your fastest growing from what I understand. So, you know, I'd love to hear your take on Chicago as a place to do business for Uber. How's Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So we have uh, offices in the old post office, which is a spectacular building. Uh, or it's really our nicest office here. We got about 1,500 employees, the majority of them working for Uber Freight. And Uber Freight is a really interesting business in that in the olden days, you used to have to pick up the phone if you wanted to get a cab. You used to have to pick up the phone and call a taxi dispatcher, and the taxi dispatcher would call a bunch of cabs uh, to get a cab over to your house in you know, half an hour, et cetera. Um, that is still true within the freight business. The logistics sector of our economy is one of the largest sectors of the economy, has been mm -hmm. um, uh, significantly underinvested in in terms of technology and a ton of the business is done by phone, on, mm. on lots of pieces of paper, et cetera. And with Uber Freight, we're essentially using a bunch of the same technology, a bunch of the original engineers who built out the Uber system in terms of routing and matching uh, and pricing and making it all automatic mm -hmm. uh, and magical and effortless for both the rider and the driver, essentially are doing the same thing for mm. digital freight brokerage. So that a shipper can essentially say, I want to send a, send a truckload from A to B. This is what I'm going to pay. Um, that offer is essentially promulgated to over a million truckers who are using the system. Mm -hmm. And the trucker can use the app to say, yep, wow, no, incredible. yep, no, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we will then help the trucker who you know, has a load to go out find a load back so that they don't have to deadhead back. Mm -hmm. uh, so that we're not, you know, Incredible. wasting a bunch of gas mm -hmm. and hurting the environment without, you know, a load being a part of that. And what we're super excited about is actually buying a company called Transplace, which is running logistics um, for companies, uh, the whole logistics systems and, and broker systems uh, for companies as well. So that's really the Chicago headquarters for Why us. Why did you pick Chicago for uh, because Chicago is like the capital the logistics. Paris of the Midwest. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a it's the Paris of logistics in yes, the, the Paris Midwest. Of logistics. I mean, it's a it's it, it's it was true. it was a natural place yeah. place for us to yeah. headquarter freight. Uh, but we have a big team in terms of our Uber Eats uh, mm -hmm. team here as well. Uh, I went and visited our Greenlight Hub to meet with some of our drivers. Yeah. So this is I think Chicago is a big office here, and I anticipate Chicago being a bigger and bigger part. Uh, of our workforce going forward. That's fantastic. And when you met with the drivers today, I'd love to yeah. talk a little bit more about that. And I was really pleased, but not surprised to hear your approach um, about listening and learning. But talk to us a little bit about that today, for example. So generally, whenever I go visit, visit any city, I have a sit down with drivers just to hear about their experience. How long have they been with us? What do we do well? More importantly, what we don't do well. Uh, and you know, our drivers and couriers, most of the drivers that I was talking to had been driving on Uber for six, seven years. Hmm. They've been with Uber longer than I had. 
Interesting. And they really understand our system. Mm -hmm. um, they, their being able to earn on Uber agrees with their li lives. You know, they've got kids to take care of, mm -hmm. uh, their retirees, et cetera. And so for me, I get input into what we can do better, what their concerns are, uh, and sometimes ideas about what we can build. So what were some of the ahas from today? You know, I wouldn't say they were ahas, which is a good thing, which, is, mm -hmm. which means that we're generally in, in touch with drivers. One of the newest features that we've launched for drivers is upfront destination and upfront fare. Uh, previously, when you took an Uber, mm -hmm. your driver wouldn't know where you're headed to. Mm -hmm. Uh, until you got into the Uber, and we designed it that way so that we would make sure that the driver wouldn't cancel on you, mm -hmm. et cetera. We built some pretty cool algorithmic technology that can price trips more accurately, mm -hmm. that allows drivers now to see their destination up front uh, and decide whether or not they want to take you mm -hmm. wherever you're going, one, one way or the other, or we make that offer to other drivers. So uh, I am very, very curious as to the experience there for drivers and determine that mm -hmm. this tech is going to work for them. The pricing technology is very new. And so, and one of the changes that we've had to make is pricing for drivers used to be purely time and distance based. Mm -hmm. Now pricing is algorithmic, which allows us to, to show the upfront destination. Hmm. Uh, and one of the issues that we have there is that drivers don't know why they are getting paid where they're getting paid. Mm -hmm. And so one of my ahas was for us to create more transparency for drivers as to if a particular trip is $14.33, right. why are why? we pricing at $14.33? How do we get to that number? So that was a great learning for me and it's something that we definitely have to work on. And then, and then the second area that I'm really focused on, uh, not just in Chicago, but everywhere is really safety. Mm -hmm. You know, drivers are, it's, um, and, and you've got to experience it for yourself, which is you're in the car and there's a stranger behind you. Mm -hmm. You know, most of us experience Uber as riders, et cetera, so you think about you're getting in someone's car. Well, think about the person who has a stranger sitting behind you in their car, which might be one of the most valuable assets that they have. Hmm. There's a lot of trust that has to go there. And so we have invested uh, quite significantly in safety features both for riders and drivers. Mm -hmm. For riders, for example, you can track your daughters when mm -hmm. they're taking Ubers, et cetera. Um, you know, when they're picked up, you know, whether when they're dropped off, we have, uh, you can call 411, you can contact an ADT agent anytime that you feel unsafe, mm -hmm. which is terrific. But one of the features that I'm personally very excited about that we are piloting in Chicago and a couple of other cities is that you can record your ride now. As a rider and as a driver, mm -hmm. you can start your ride recording, the other person is gonna be notified. And that, especially for drivers, is another layer of safety. Hmm. Um, the recording stays on the phone, can't be accessed by anyone, it's totally encrypted, unless something happens and it, right. and it has to go to customer service, et cetera. And what we've seen is, and it's not a surprise, when people are being recorded, they just behave better. <laughs> Right? I see that like in retail. I am. I'd I be see that like in retail. cursing all over the place right now. But uh, it, and so that for us, the, the idea of recording, right. reducing the number of incidents is a huge win for us. We're, we will introduce, we're building out video recording as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because we want Uber to be the safest transportation platform on earth for riders, but especially for drivers who are in that car for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, how do you? publicize, well, first of all, when you show up to do one of these huddles, yeah. are the herders surprised? Or do they know you're coming? They, and how do you let other people in the company know? Because you can't be everywhere, but I'm sure they admire that you're doing this. How do you let them know? Well, happening? I don't know if they admire it, but <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Cause, because I, I send my engineers notes, and I think I'm a pain in their ass. Yes, but, that's but, good. But, you know, I, I need to be sometimes. Yeah. Um, no, I don't mean the team that you go tell what to fix. I'm talking about the folks that <laughs> show up. The drivers probably really admire. Well, I think this. the drivers. We invite them and we say, yeah. uh, "Come have a discussion with the CEO." So, so I hadn't met, and actually, I'd met uh, one of them previously. Uh, but I, I think for them, they tell me what's on their mind. They, mm -hmm. they don't seem to be especially impressed by me. So, mm -hmm. that's good. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's that's. I find that in retail. 
when whether it's Ulta and Output Locker, but bringing together folks in the stores just to listen and learn. You get the I get the stuff. same thing, and nobody feels all that surprised yeah. or shaked to see the CEO. It's really yeah. fantastic. And then, for example, I was at the these. We have these green light hubs that help drivers, um, physical customer service, and just the it, it's it's quite. You need a lot of documentation to actually get online for Uber. Mm -hmm. We need background checks. You need licensing. We need to inspect your car. We need your insurance. We need your license, et cetera. So the, the process of onboarding can be quite complex. So as an example, I'm sure you mm -hmm. love you know, walking your stores. For me, it's sitting behind these Greenlight Hub agents and watching drivers as they come up and listening to their issues and seeing how these agents essentially help out these drivers. You know, the fact that the drivers have to show up to a green light hub is a failure for us to some ah, extent. Okay. Because hopefully the drivers should be able to help themselves mm -hmm. online, get on board without having to come. So for me also, observing those interactions is, is super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, I've listened to a lot of your interviews. One, I was running this morning. I listened to Market Watch that you did just recently. So I'm not stalking. I'm just listening. <laughs> but I was really impressed to hear the way you define the mission of the business reimagining the way the world moves, comma, for the better. For the better. For the better. Yeah. So I just picked that up today. So let's talk about the movement part first, which is how you're defining, you know, your business. Obviously, I think we have a general sense that it's more than just about ride sharing. Mm -hmm. So today, maybe where it goes in the future. What do you, how do you define the future of movement? Well, I, I think for us, um, we define movement as movement of people, movement of things, and, you know, movement of trucks. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we want to wire up every single vehicle on earth hmm. that is available to move people, whether it's a ride share vehicle or it's a taxi. We have mm -hmm. taxis in New York, we have taxis in Paris, uh, we've got taxis in San Francisco, buses, subways, any way for you to get point, uh, from point A to B. We want to wire up that vehicle and make it available for anyone on demand. Um, we want to be able to deliver to you food, groceries, alcohol. Um, in Canada, we're doing cannabis. cannabis we can't yeah. do it here yet, but <laughs> you never that. know. Uh, and essentially deliver anything to your home. And then with Uber Freight, mm -hmm. essentially wire up every carrier to make them available to shippers. And you know, these carriers couldn't work for Pepsi-Cola previously. Mm -hmm. But an individual carrier now can, through our system, mm -hmm essentially do the job, jobs that were only available for trucking fleets, et, et cetera. So we essentially want to wire up everything that can move people or things mm -hmm. uh, and make it available to the world. Uh, but ultimately, we also have to do so in a way that's responsible that is for the better. Mm -hmm. So as we're making those investments, we are making investments, for example, in electrifying our fleet. Right. Um, in investing into getting more than one person in a car to reduce congestion uh, and investing in making sure that, you know, as we reimagine movement, ultimately we're reimagining it for the better. So the um, electric, let's talk about that. Yes. Autonomous vehicles, let's talk about that. Where are you taking all this? <laughs> uh, so first electric. Uh, we are, we have committed by 2030. Mm -hmm to be essentially carbon neutral, not have any emissions as it relates to our mobility fleet in the US, Canada, and Europe. Um, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Now, in California, 9% of our vehicle miles already are mm -hmm. electric. Okay. Uh, and the big blocker there is affordability of, ele of, of electric car, right. vehicles, mm -hmm. and then the charging infrastructure mm -hmm. being available for drivers who have made that leap uh, to vehicles. So we are working with partners like Hertz, um, it, where Hertz is buying 50,000 Teslas and is renting those Teslas to our drivers. Hmm. Uh, we are then taking a discount on our booking fee. So for every trip mm -hmm. that's an electric trip, we essentially pay a dollar more to drivers okay. so that they have the kind of positive flywheel of better economics mm -hmm. uh, as a result of their driving electric. And now we're working with um, cities really all over the world to make sure that the charging infrastructure that's put in place, first of all, the investments are aggressive enough, but the infrastructure goes into the right places because the infrastructure always goes into the center cities mm -hmm. where the wealthy folks live. But a lot of our drivers, they don't have garages. 
um, overnight charging would be incredibly valuable for them so right. that they don't have to take an hour out of the day when they could be earning charging, but getting charging infrastructure in the neighborhoods where our drivers live uh, so that they can have overnight charging available to them is something that is near and dear to our heart, and we're having discussions with lots of people around that. Autonomous is something mm -hmm. that will eventually come, but I'd say I've, I'm spending a lot more of my time thinking about this electric transition uh, because 2030 is going to sneak up on us. I was going to say, quickly. that is not very far away. Yeah. So I, you're a modeler and a guy who writes algorithms, but how do you picture that really by 2030 what you describe is possible? Um, well, you need affordable vehicles. And so right now, right. electric vehicles are a luxury item. Yeah. Uh, and we need more Nissan Leafs out there that are truly uh, affordable. You know, our number one uh, vehicle type worldwide is a used Prius. Uh, and so we need that economic model to go there. But we think if the, uh, if the affordable vehicles get out there, and I think it's, it's a matter of two to three days because there's mm -hmm. incredible investments going into the plant there then the uptake is going to be there because riders love it, drivers love it. Obviously, with higher gas prices now, there's yet another economic incentive to switch over. So it's all about affordability of vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, switching to the for the better part, or more on the for the better yes. part. So I was really curious to learn about diversity, inclusion at the company. And I took a skeptical eye a little bit because, you know. As I, you should. Yes, we should. Um, you know, first I looked at the corporate social responsibility reports and the diversity, which didn't surprise me because I, I would imagine that the company's pretty diverse in some ways. Looked at your board, that's very diverse. That's a little easier to do some days than this, which is I always like to look at somebody's senior team. So go to the website, who reports to Dara? And I was impressed. I was impressed by the diversity of your senior team, gender and race. So talk a little more about that. How did you do that? Well, I think for us it's, you know, diversity is a matter of, you want your company to look like the customers that you serve. Uh, and our earner population is incredibly diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, our users, sure. our riders, right. our it's eaters everybody. are incredibly diverse. And, and we just needed Uber to look more like the world. Uh, and, and frankly, we had a long way to go. So since in five years, for example, we've increased the percentage of women in leadership at Uber. It's gone from 22% to 37%. You know, it's got to get to 50%. Yeah. We have a long way to go, but increasing that percentage by 15 points is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more than tripled the number of underrepresented people in leadership at the company, but it's at, a, at about 11% now, uh, and it should be closer to 20%. Mm -hmm. So for us, diversity, it, it's you're not going to be able to achieve diversity overnight. Um, you have to work on it in terms of the kind of people that you recruit into the company, your retention, mm -hmm. and then also recruiting at a senior level. You and I were talking right. about that, you know, the Tony Wests of the world, the Nelson mm -hmm. Jays of the world, et cetera, so that a, you know, young black man can, who's working at Uber can look up and say, you know, the general counsel of this company is pretty freaking awesome, mm -hmm. and I want to be just like him. So it, it really requires a lot of work at different levels of the company, but ultimately the goal is to become a better company and a better company mm -hmm. It's more just truly representative of the customers and it serves. Right, but there is a war on talent, as we know, especially yeah. for diverse talent. So how does Uber win? Yeah, but win? Uber's awesome. I was going to say, how does yeah. Uber win? <laughs> because Uber's awesome. Well, okay. I think where, where we win is, is, is the impact that the company has mm. on, on the world. Because, the, you know, we, we one of the, the tech that we build is incredibly cool. Uh, we're building this technical layer on top of the real world. And real world problems are very, very interesting to solve. Mm -hmm. Right when you push that button and the car shows up in five minutes, there are algorithms that are determining a match and pricing dynamically, and they essentially have inventory of every single car in the city, and they pick the right driver for you at the right price to get them to you in four minutes. That technology is very cool, but the impact that Uber has, you know, if we get it wrong, it's not like you got a bad search result. It's not yeah. like, you know, well, my search for my video didn't, didn't work well. You know, if you don't get that ride to the airport, it's a real issue. Right. And to build a platform where five million people around the world are earning, um, that is real world, local city mm -hmm. impact that our teams are very, very passionate about. 
Uh, and that ultimately is what sets Uber apart from the other companies. We're not a pure, you know, we build really cool tech, but we've got our feet firmly planted in the cities in which we operate. Mm -hmm. uh, and that differentiation is something that attracts a certain kind of DNA of person who wants to take on really hard problems. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the real world has a way of punching you in the face. Like it all looks good on paper, mm -hmm. but to make these delightful experiences happen every single time is a real challenge, both technical and operational challenge. And, you know, there are people who want to take that on. Yeah. I want to ask more about some, a couple broader um, tech topics before we then do a lightning round and let uh -oh. people go. Okay. We only have about 10 minutes left. But before we do, you've mentioned cities a lot. We've talked about Chicago. Is there anything else that we can do in Chicago to help Uber grow faster, to be a bigger part of your business? What does it look like? Um, take more rides. Okay. Uh, but th that would help. But actually, <laughs> okay. the, 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 big, the biggest thing in Chicago, I'll tell you, is, is we need more earners. We need more drivers ah, okay. uh, out there. Right now, Uber generally, we, we don't have a demand problem. We have a supply problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we are investing aggressively in campaigns to bring earners onto mm -hmm. the platform. That's one of the reasons why we're investing in safety. And earnings levels are actually very attractive right now. So mm -hmm. in Chicago, the average earner in Chicago is earning about $41 per hour where they're utilized, where they're working on the platform. So that attractiveness is bringing a lot of earners right. onto the platform. And Hopefully we'll get What's more. your best source or strategy for getting more earners, typically? It, you know, we are the, when you're talking about five million earners, mm -hmm. you have to get them from everywhere. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we go online channels, but our number one earner recruitment tool is other earners, yeah. is other drivers. So at the driver forum, uh, I was talking to a uh, husband and wife and son, all of whom were driving cool. for Uber. And especially in some of these immigrant communities, yeah. you know, a bunch of them get in. Uh, and I'd say the number one issue that we have now is some of these earners don't have access to vehicles. Mm -hmm. That last sure. year were super expensive, but this year shouldn't be a problem getting vehicles. Right. That's super interesting. So a little bit more on tech opportunities. So you have an app that is, well, there's 100 million active Uber users, I think. 124. But 124, OK. And that's a, lot of real, that's a lot of people with your real estate on their phone. We all know that if you're on that phone, it's all about that. Uber only really works if you're on a phone, right? But what else do you see? Uh, I've heard talk about a super app yes. where the app can sort of access everything. But talk a little bit about where you see taking that. Well, that essentially, we started as a car sharing app, you know, push a button and you get uh, a car. But we really want to extend to every single transportation type mm -hmm. in your city, uh, e-bikes, taxis buses, et cetera. Uh, so we're really extending all of the different transportation types. We're actually, we have a company in Australia now, Car Next Door, where mm -hmm. you can rent another person's car for a weekend, for example. Oh, that's cool. Any use case where you drive, mm -hmm. we're trying to essentially build an on-demand use case so that you can replace that use case. And now we're introducing, for example, reserve, so that if you need mm -hmm. a car at 6 a.m. to pick you up, take you to the airport, you absolutely know that that driver is going to be there uh, to pick you up for, for that airport really... trip. We are now extending the Uber app to also include Uber Eats. So if you open up your Uber uh, mm -hmm. app, you have an Eats app, but the, the super app concept is essentially any place you want to go, anything you want to eat or get delivered to your home, Uber can be there for you. And it's a real advantage that we have over our competitors mm -hmm. in that there are pure ride share players, Right. There are pure delivery players, uh, but there's no one who is bringing it together. Hmm. And with freight, we have a service that can get you know goods from a factory to local warehouses. And then with Uber Eats, you can we can get those goods from the local warehouses actually right. to your home. Uh, and that is a unique proposition that will take some time to build out. Right. But there's no company out there that is thinking about transportation as holistically as we are, right. and who has a global footprint, the kind of global footprint that we do. Incredible. Crypto, okay, crypto's not been so popular this week, the last couple of weeks, but can, can you, is Bitcoin a currency? It's not going away, but you know, can you pay with Bitcoin yet, or no. will that be in the future? No, it would be think? useless to pay with Bitcoin on Uber. I mean, Bitcoin is, I, I do believe in cryptocurrency mm -hmm. um, as a potential store of value. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Bitcoin as a potential store of value, but the friction cost of transacting 
right. with Bitcoin at this point are, are far too high. The, envir the environmental costs make absolutely no sense at this point. Uh, so I think the technical aspects of making it easier to transact could get us to a point where it would make sense to accept crypto. At this point, it certainly doesn't make sense. Okay. I'm just going to ask you all the tech questions because uh, you're I, here. I mean, the, the, Metaverse, the, the, that's the, the next environmental topic. impact of crypto would be way more than the car. Yeah, right? okay, you it just got doesn't it. make sense. All right, scratch that one up. Uber in the metaverse. Are you thinking about how Uber shows up in the metaverse? Um, and do you care? We, we, we are firmly focused on the Uberverse. The, the, the Uberverse. World. Yeah. Good answer. All right, last question. Twitter. Yes, no. You're advertising on Twitter, right? We're advertising on Twitter. I think what's happening there is, you know, sometimes scary, sometimes exciting. But, <laughs> you know, Elon Musk is one of the all-time great entrepreneurs of our generation. Um, and I, he's constantly on my Twitter feed, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching just like you are. <laughs> I love that. Okay, we have five minutes left. We're just going to ask you a few lightning round All questions, right. okay? So, just for fun. All right. Beautiful. Tell us something that a lot of people do Pass. not know about no, you. I'm no passes. I, yeah, that's how this game is played here, Dara. Yeah, exactly. Uh, something that really most people don't know about you. I don't know if most people don't know about, uh, about me, but I'm a, I'm a big gamer. I do so know that, I yes. love board games, and I, and I was a gamer growing up. Uh, and one of our family traditions with my uh, with the kids is playing board games, geeky board games, Settlers of Catan, of course, uh, etc. On weekends, and you know, it's 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 how I get to connect with my kids. Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, oh yeah. I know. Time. What's your character class? I've heard. Um, of I I'm a gnome wizard. Okay, uh, and, and I have uh, no idea what that means, but. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a, a little little smart person. And, okay, you know, I can, okay. I'm, <laughs> I know a, I'm a very active role player, so. Oh, I love that. Okay, what was your first job? Uh, my first job was pumping gas at a, um, at a gas station. I really, so it was, I, like I started that. in transportation, there you go. That is so fun. Okay, you're in an Uber car. I know you do talk to people, so what's the favorite thing to talk to people about? Uh, usually I ask them, you know, most, a lot of drivers are immigrants, and when I see that they're immigrants, I ask them where they're from, mm -hmm. uh, and then how they like uh, driving for Uber. My okay. rating should be a little bit better, though, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I bet. Um, so, if you could have a meal delivered from any restaurant in the world, what would it be? Uber Eats meal uh, delivered. Any restaurant in the world. Um, it, it would have to be, so, when we were kids, uh, one of the big treats that we had was going to a uh, French steakhouse called Entrecote. And they have like this amazing steak, cut, cut up steak. So I could, if I could get an Entrecote steak along with the fries, Maybe I'd be in. Maybe somebody can help you there with you that go. here. I think somebody can. Yeah. Um, okay, why, is it true and why did your wife wear a Slayer t-shirt to your wedding? Um, <laughs> she was ready to get, you know, killed. I don't know, she was looking forward to the, to the marriage. No, we, 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 uh, I had the bright idea of getting married on December 12th, um, 2012, 12, 12, 12. Okay. It's a very lucky number. Okay. Um, it was ourselves and like 40,000 other people who had that same idea. <laughs> um, and we Las got married, we got married in Las Vegas at the Little White Chapel. Oh and gosh. so you wear a Slayer t-shirt. Was Elvis involved? Elvis uh, there was no Elvis, but that okay. was, that would have been a good idea. Okay. That's, I love that. Um, so what is, now we're going to be a little more serious, but I'm just curious, like what's the best piece of business advice that you've gotten or, the, or that you might share with this audience? The best piece of, it's a little bit of a long story, but um, I, I, uh, I got it from Barry Diller, which is, which is not a surprise. Uh, and I was having an issue with my team where I did not agree with where my team was going in a particular direction. And Barry saw that in me. Uh, and, um, and after we, we, he saw that I was unhappy with, with the direction that, that I was going, you know, I told him, I said, listen, I, I don't want to go against my team. Uh, and, and, you know, they, I've got to be supportive of my team in the direction that they want to go in. And what Barry told us, listen, if all you do is listen to your team, the advice that you're getting is probably the average of the advice that everyone else is getting to them. Mm. And so you're getting, you know, the, the opinion is the average opinion of the average. And he looks at me and he says, I didn't bring you on board to be average. Mm. Uh, and so his message to me was, as a leader of the company, there are moments where you have to do the unexpected, where you have to step out of your comfort zone 
and if it's left up to a committee of 15 people to make a decision, they're going to make the average decision, which in those circumstances is not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So as leaders, you know, don't be average, I guess, is the is <laughs> advice. It's actually really great advice. You have four kids. What's the best piece of advice you think you've given them? They might not think it, but that you think has been the best advice. Um, just nothing replaces hard work. Mm. Like, I, I, I don't care about success or failure, fall down, you have glory. Uh, I want you to give it your all. Uh, and I, that's what I want for my kids. You know, it's not about the end result. Did they give it their all? Um, you know, because if you're casual about life, you're just going to get casual in return, and that's no fun. Are any of the kids soccer players? Oh, yes. Uh, two of them are soccer players. Score and, goals. Uh, uh, <laughs> and I'm very happy to see it. That's awesome. All right, I have one last question. There's a lot of people here. How long ago should I have called my Uber? <laughs> to get home. No, you, seriously. I, uh, you, you should have ordered an Uber reserve. And you'd I be all know set. I should have. I just want to say thank you and thank you all for being here tonight. And Dara, great thank job. Thank you.